Roberts and Georgie, who had once said that research is to see what everybody else has seen and to think what nobody else has thought. Today, we have amidst us an exemplary scientist whose research is a true embodiment of this quote. His research in the field of chemical biology had led to the development of novel synthetic substitutes to perform functions of native enzymes. He and his research team has synthesized numerous organometallics as enzyme mimics that could potentially replace dysfunctional enzymes. These small molecules that serve as artificial enzymes can regulate redox signaling in cells, thus bringing about a new paradigm in the treatment of diseases. Also, these nanozymes, as they have been called, have been intelligently used by his team in deciphering the unknown facets involved in the thyroid hormone metabolism. This has opened up new avenues for drug discovery. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the great honor of introducing the speaker of the day, Professor Govindaswamy Mugesh, a renowned inorganic and physical chemist, or a chemical biologist, as uh, we could call him now. This versatile scientist is a true son of the soil. He belongs to a family of farmers. And you would be surprised to know that he has very close ties with our region. He completed his MSc from Kadar Moedim College, affiliated to the Bharati Dasan University uh, in Abhiram, Adhiramapatnam. After which, he went on to complete his PhD from IIT Bombay in 1998. He had several productive postdoctoral stints in Germany and USA with renowned chemists like Professor Wolf Walter Dumont, Helmut Sayes, and Casey Nicolau. He returned to India in 2002 and joined the Indian Institute of Science, Bengaluru, where he established the Chemical Biology, Bio, Inorganic, and Medicine Chemistry Laboratory. The main focus of research in Professor Mugesh's laboratory is to understand the chemistry and biology of medicinally important metalloproteins and to develop novel synthetic methodologies for functionally mimicking the active site of uh, several enzymes. His group is also involved in designing efficient enzyme inhibitors, which have immense medicinal value. He is currently a professor at the Inorganic and Physical Chemistry Department at the Indian Institute of Science. There is a long list of accomplishments of Professor Mukesh, uh, of which I can go on and on, but I'm going to see, uh, save that time uh, by giving us very brief account of his achievements. His passion to explore new domains has resulted in new research directions with very productive outcomes. He has won many awards in recognition of his research contributions. I'm just going to list some of the uh, salient ones. Uh, these include the IUPAC Young Chemist Award in 2005, the Swarna Jayanti Fellowship in 2008, the AstraZeneca Excellence in Chemistry Award in 2011, the very prestigious Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Award in 2012, and uh, recently the Infosys Prize for Physical Sciences in the year 2019. He is also this year's joint winner of the Sastra Siyana Rao Award in Chemistry and Material Science. Today, Professor Mukesh is going to give us a glimpse of his research journey, and his talk is centered on nanozymes for cellular redox control and biomedical applications, which I'm sure is going to be a very inspirational and motivational lecture and an interesting topic for the young students who are listening uh, now. I now request Professor Mukesh to deliver the Sastra CNR Award Lecture. Uh, over to you, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, give this talk, the Sastra National Science Day Award Lecture. And I'm particularly uh, pleased to deliver this talk uh, Sastra CNR Rao Award Lecture. And I thank Sastra for selecting me for this award. And uh, in today's talk, I will talk to you about uh, some of our work at the interfaces uh, of chemistry and the biology. Uh, I would like to uh, share my slides now.
I am going to talk to you on nanozymes for cellular redox control and biomedical applications. And before I give my talk, uh, I thank uh, Professor Sienna Rao, who inspired me in many ways. And I am delighted to deliver this Astra Sienna Rao Award Lecture. And uh, Professor Sienna Rao is a Bharat Ratna FRS. Uh, currently at JNCSR Bangalore, is a great inspiration for many of us. And uh, I met him many times in meetings and he's uh, 86 years old. And uh, But if you see his energy and enthusiasm in doing research even today is amazing. And uh, as you know, uh, the International Year of uh, uh, Periodic Table of chemical elements was celebrated in 2019. And uh, when this journal, Chemistry, a European journal, asked Professor Rao about uh, his element, the, his favorite element, he mentioned about oxygen. So in my element, you can see the title here. He talked about oxygen and metal oxides. I'm going to talk about these two, oxygen and metal oxide, but in in a completely different way, completely different aspect of oxygen and metal oxide. If you consider the elements which are biologically important, we call them as the elements of life. One can say that it's approximately 28. Some of them are bulk biological elements as shown here. These ones, the one green color, bulk biological elements. And then essential elements, which is it's here, most of them are first row transition metals. And some of them are possibly essential for life. In today's talk, I'm going to touch upon few elements, which we call them as elements of life and how they are important and what type of chemical reactions they mediate in human body. I'll start with iron and oxygen chemistry. You know photosynthesis, right? We all know about photosynthesis, uh, it's an amazing process in biological system where oxygen is a byproduct, right? Carbon dioxide is utilized to make carbohydrate. And in these biological processes, iron plays very important role. In human body, iron is present in four to five grams, but only one milligram is lost per day. If you look at the role of iron in human body, we all know about hemoglobin, right? As part of the red blood cells, oxygen binds to hemoglobin and then it's carried all over the body, go to different tissues and cells. Then biological functions happen. But what happens if this metal is not regulated properly? Okay. We know when you put an iron rod with the moisture, for example, a mixture of water and oxygen, you leave the iron rod outside for a few days, what we see is that rusting takes place, right? But our human body contains, stores four to five grams of iron and a lot of oxygen and a lot of water in human body. And why we don't talk about rusting in human body? And in biological term, rusting means dysregulation of iron homeostasis. And then the chemical reactions, undesired chemical reactions that take place in human body. And this is the reason why iron in biology is tightly regulated. In 2019, 
Nobel Prize was awarded in physiology or medicine to three scientists for their discoveries of how cells sense and adapt to oxygen availability. They talked about normoxia, hypoxia, anoxia conditions, and how this the cell sensing oxygen availability is important for biological functions. So in today's talk, I chose these topics, nanozymes for cellular redox control and biomedical application. But the way I will describe different topics goes like this. I'm going to talk about cellular redox control first and then nanozymes and how such nanozymes can be used for biomedical applications. When we are talking about redox control, particularly cellular redox control, we cannot ignore hydrogen peroxide, right? Hydrogen peroxide, the chemical structure is shown here, very interesting, uh, you know, molecule in biology. It's a small molecule involved in signaling pathways, regulating the redox status. So there are many books and reviews on oxidants in biology. When we talk about oxidant in oxidants in biology, it's a question of balance, right? How the natural systems balance oxidants and antioxidants, how they regulate the amount of oxidants present in the cells. Hydrogen peroxide is one of the oxidants, right? Before going to our work, I will give you a brief history about hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen peroxide and central redox theory for aerobic life. Alexander von Humboldt synthesized one of the first synthetic peroxides known as barium peroxide in 1799 as a byproduct of his attempts to decompose air. But in 1818, Theonard first described that the treatment of barium peroxide with nitric oxide, nitric acid produces a compound and which we call, call it now as hydrogen peroxide. But there is a long history about the role of hydrogen peroxide in biological system. So the first indication that hydrogen peroxide was formed in vivo that followed the discovery of catalase by Loewy 120 years ago. And this was a seminal paper appeared in science in 1900, a new enzyme of general occurrence in organisms. But the role of hydrogen peroxide, the generation of hydrogen peroxide in biological system, in cellular respiration was a matter of intense debate between Wieland and Warburg. That happened in 1920s. Lot of argument between, between these two. So in 1913, Wieland proposed the formation of hydrogen peroxide during respiration. And he demonstrated sugar is dehydrogenated and dihydrogen reacts with the molecular oxygen. And hydrogen peroxide, in fact, is produced in human body produced in biological systems. But Warburg did not agree. And many years of intense debate happened. Warburg said, because there is no experiment that supports the theory and no consequence that fits the theory, it should no longer be taken into account. And frustrated by the arguments and the debates, Wieland sacrifices a dog, but does not find hydrogen peroxide. And today we know that hydrogen peroxide is controlled by several enzymes and therefore one may not find hydrogen peroxide just like, you know, it's not easy to find hydrogen peroxide, but it does exist uh, in human body. How hydrogen peroxide is produced? I'm going to very fundamental reactions. Okay, so uh, when we talk about hydrogen peroxide and uh, central redox theory for aer aerobic life, 
this all starts with molecular oxygen right i talked about uh, uh, you know uh, the molecular oxygen element oxygen how it's important starting from uh, you know binding to hemoglobin and transporting uh, to different parts of the body for uh, biological functions this is one of the most fundamental reactions that takes place in human body you add one electron to molecular oxygen it's generate superoxide and superoxide is produced by nadph oxidases by one electron reduction right if we add one more electron to superoxide it gives hydrogen peroxide third electrons generate hydroxyl radical and water and hydroxyl radical is oxidant highly reactive damage by molecules cleave dna but if you add the fourth electron it goes to water okay there are four electrons involved in conversion of oxygen to water and the four electron reduction is very very important process in human body during respiration in mitochondria oxygen is converted to water by an enzyme called cytochrome c oxidase key enzyme in mitochondria maintain the mitochondrial integrity but these are called reactive oxygen species superoxide hydrogen peroxide hydroxyl radical people call it in a different different names partial partially reduced oxygen species are reactive oxygen species and these reactive oxygen species are controlled by several enzymes and that's the focus of my talk today superoxide dismutase converts superoxide to hydrogen peroxide glutathione peroxidase catalytically convert hydrogen peroxide to water catalase converts hydrogen peroxide to water and molecular oxygen other proteins like thyroidoxin glutaridoxin peroxidoxins and these enzymes since they take care of reactive oxygen species these enzymes are called antioxidant enzymes because they are acting on oxidants like hydrogen peroxide and uh, the chemist uh, chemistry students and biology students know if you have a hydrogen peroxide bottle in the lab and you open the cap without wearing a gloves you will see the white color like this what happens the skin proteins get oxidized by hydrogen peroxide and if that is the case oxidant hydrogen peroxide is highly reactive how is it controlled in the human body and these enzymes control the level of hydrogen peroxide so the redox control is all about the balance how how the system is balanced and when the level of reactive oxygen species is much higher and the antioxidant system cannot handle tox to the reactive oxygen species it leads to an imbalance in the redox state in the cells and that we call it as oxidative stress so oxidative stress is an imbalance between reactive oxygen species generating and scavenging systems and today many major diseases that we know are associated with oxidative stress reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species so these are the reactive oxygen and nitrogen species superoxide hydrogen peroxide peroxynitrate hydroxyl radical hypochlorous acid nit and nitric nitric oxide is an important molecule right adaptive signaling molecule but if it combines with the superoxide it produce peroxynitrite very very dangerous biological oxidant and nitrating agents and any major disease you name is associated with oxidative stress and this is where uh, why we need to understand the antioxidant enzymes in human body and other uh, you know in other mammals and how one can design small molecules which function as an enzyme so my talk is going to be entirely on this topic 
So I now come to artificial enzymes. We all know about enzymes, right? Enzymes are bio biological molecules, typically proteins. And we also know that enzymes speed up chemical reactions that support life. And therefore they are biological catalysts. They play essential roles in respiration, digestion of food, muscle and nerve functions, and many other functions. So what is interesting about enzymes is that they bind to molecules and alter them in very specific ways. And the human body contains hundreds of such enzymes. You can see the simple model given here, the enzyme active site, where the substrate comes and binds to the active site. Then a chemical reaction takes place between the substrate and, and uh, you know, two substrates. Then the products are eliminated and the reaction takes place at the active site of an enzyme. I have shown one active site here, which is called heme active site in many proteins. And the simple chemical catalysts have been designed to achieve some desirable futures of enzymes. And uh, from 1980s onwards, the concept of artificial enzymes came into play and uh, the chemist trying to mimic the function of enzymes by using small molecules and nanomaterials. And we have been working on uh, small molecules for many years. And the enzymes that we were interested in is called glutathione peroxidase. It's a very unique enzyme because this enzyme convert hydrogen peroxide to water without generating any free radicals. Okay, and people call this as a stoichiometrically clean reaction. So when we talk about organic peroxides, it produces alcohol, and in this process, it uses a substrate called glutathione. Glutathione is a very well-known antioxidant uh, in the body. And reduced glutathione is used for this, by these enzymes. And what is unique about this enzyme is that this enzyme has selenium in the active site. And many do not believe that selenium is present in human body. Selenium is one of the essential elements. And uh, we know about 21st amino acid right and uh, genetically coded amino acids selenocysteine so there are 25 selenoproteins in human body which play key roles and the selenocysteine in the active site of an enzyme mediates this reaction and why selenium why nature chose selenium for this type of reaction is is because the selenol group in selenocysteine has a pk of 5.2 which is much lower than the pk of a thiol group in cysteine which is 8.3 and that's again lower than the hydroxyl group in serine which is 13. so just one atom substitution oxygen to sulfur to selenium you see how dramatically uh, the the pka changes and the reactivity changes so therefore selenocysteine is extremely reactive in this enzyme active site and uh, we we have been working many years on small molecules which actually can substitute uh, glutathione peroxidase in, in the cells or function as these enzymes, take care of some of the activities of these enzymes. And uh, we have been working on this type of small molecules, which I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, starting from epsilon, which is known as the first glutathione peroxidase mimetic uh, reported in 1984, and recently it attracted uh, interest in the field of uh, uh, antiviral drugs. Uh, this is a paper in Nature uh, appeared last year after the uh, pandemic uh, uh, broke out. These authors screened 10,000 compounds and identified epsilon as one of the six potential COVID-19 therapeutics. Okay, and uh, this is an interesting compound. And what are nanozymes? And we know small molecules which functionally mimic these enzymes. For many years, chemists have uh, worked on small molecules, taking inspiration from the active site of an enzymes, which are, you know, many of them are proteins. But in recent years, nanoparticles have been used for a wide range of biomedical and technological applications. And when the nanomaterials exhibit enzyme-like activity, and these nanomaterials are called nanozymes. 
so nanozymes are nanomaterials which exhibit enzyme like activity and uh, this started with uh, a surprising discovery that fe3o4 nanoparticles and uh, the exhibit intrinsic peroxidase like activity so the paper appeared in 2007 about uh, heme peroxidase like activity of fe3o4 and uh, fe3o4 is known for uh, decades and this is called a magnetite right fe3o4 is a mineral and one of the main iron ores but these authors have shown that fe3o4 exhibits an enzyme like activity and these nanoparticles are generally considered to be biologically and chemically inert and that's the reason why it's surprising and this nanozyme functionally mimic the heme peroxidase when hydrogen peroxide is used as a substrate i talked about hydrogen peroxide how important it is in biological systems and this has a heme active site and one of, one of the heme peroxidase which we all know is thyroid peroxidase because that is the one that makes thyroid hormone in 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 the thyroid gland t4 t3 these are thyroid thyroid hormones synthesized by this enzyme thyroid peroxidase using hydrogen peroxide as the substrate so we started looking at nanomaterials that can function as enzymes and our aim was to functionally mimic glutathione peroxidase because when we started this work there was no nanomaterial that can mimic the function of glutathione peroxidase because glutathione peroxidase is a selenoenzyme enzyme and functionally mimicking that enzyme is is difficult so only few selenium compounds have have been shown to mimic the function of glutathione peroxidase and we directed our attention to vanadium a biological element human body contains about 20 mg of vanadium so we thought whether we can make nanomaterials containing vanadium although 20 mg vanadium is present in human body its function exact role of vanadium is not known and vanadium is an interesting element in biological system and uh, you can see here it has beautiful colors you know depending on the oxidation state you change the oxidation state and a uh, yeah, change in the color beautiful color change is observed which depends on the oxidation state of vanadium and also the blood of tunicates they are marine organisms they are also known as sea, sea squids or sea cucumbers they contains proteins called vanabins and these are proteins they bind vanadium in very high concentrations and they can actually take up 100 times more vanadium than the surrounding sea water and you can see here these are called tunicates light bulb light bulb tunicates they look like light bulbs right and beautiful uh, marine organisms they contain the color is due to vanadium and you can also see the mushrooms some of the very special mushrooms they contain vanadium and uh, the chemical structure is shown here and this is a uh, present in this type of mushrooms and apart from the color they also seem to have interesting biological activities one of such activities is associated with an enzyme called vanadium haloperoxidase and large variety of vanadium haloperoxidases you know variety of species contains this one and mainly they chlorinate or brominate organic substrates you can see the bromination brominated substrates here and brominated substrates here chlorinated so most of the environmentally found halogenated organic substrates are synthesized by vanadium haloperoxidase and we thought why don't we make a nanomaterial use a nanomaterial which acts similar to vanadium haloperoxidase but not the function is not halogenation reaction but antioxidant activity and when we look at the catalytic cycle of vanadium haloperoxidase first step is the reaction with the hydrogen peroxide and that's what we are talking about hydrogen peroxide uh, you know the role of hydrogen peroxide in redox control cellular signaling and the vanadium forms a vanadium 
peroxo bond so then the vanadium peroxo linkage here is opened up by a halide right it can be a chloride bromide and then a halogenating uh, intermediate is produced and that halogenates organic substrates so our idea was very simple if you substitute the halides with the highly reactive thiol which 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 we talked about glutathione because glutathione peroxidase uses glutathione as cofactor if you replace the halides with another nucleophile like glutathione can we achieve an antioxidant activity instead of halo peroxidase activity and that was the starting point for our studies because you can open up the peroxo linkage with the nucleophile glutathione so we synthesized b2o5 vanadium pentoxide nanowires so the idea that we had was hydrogen peroxide should be converted to water not like catalase where oxygen is generated but in this case it should use glutathione as the cofactor inside the cells and what we did we coupled the glutathione system with glutathione reductase which is an enzyme that controls the level of glutathione in the human body and use nadph as the cofactor so what we did instead of glutathione peroxidase we used b2o5 nanowire no other change we used the hydrogen peroxide which is substrate for the enzyme which used glutathione which is a cofactor for the enzyme and glutathione reductase and nadph so the entire enzymatic cycle is used but only difference is that we do not use the enzyme but we use b2o5 nanowires and you can see here when we use this all this component vanadium pentoxide nanowires glutathione glutathione reductase hydrogen peroxide nadph you see there is a catalytic activity and we found that it exactly mimic glutathione peroxidase this catalytically reduce hydrogen peroxide to water without generating any other reactive oxygen species so we checked that in 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 mammalian cells and we found that in fact this material is taken up by the cells and it shows antioxidant activity inside the cells you can see this is untreated cells and cells treated with the b2o5 nanowire there is no toxicity there is no uh, there is no increase in the reactive oxygen species when we treat the cells with the hydrogen peroxide you can see there is an enhancement in in the fluorescence due to increase in the reactive oxygen species but when we treat the cells with b2o5 and the level of reactive oxygen species is brought back to the normal level and we also found that this nanomaterial indeed uses glutathione which is present inside the cells for its catalytic activity when we treat the cells with the allyl alcohol which depletes glutathione level in the in the cells you can see there is an enhancement in the reactive oxygen species so therefore this enzyme this nanomaterial uses glutathione and exhibits glutathione peroxidase activity and this was the first report showing a nanomaterial exhibiting glutathione peroxidase like activity even inside the cells and we characterize you know many of the intermediates you know we analyzed the cellular uptake using icp aes how much of vanadium pentoxide nanowire got into the cells and so on but one key point that we looked into is the redox reactions because i'm going to, i'm talking about redox control and the vanadium is redox active right so how one can use vanadium the redox active vanadium and which is known as oxidant because many uh, organic reactions where vanadium pentoxide is used as an oxidant so uh, people may think that uh, this is something uh, you know unusual because we are showing antioxidant activity of vanadium uh, vanadium pentoxide which is known to be an oxidant and the oxidant the oxidizing property of vanadium pentoxide is due to redox reactions right even the c uh, you know c cucumber the tunicates i talked about the vanadium undergo reduction to vanadium 4 and ultimately to vanadium 3 which is stored at very high concentration in the cells 350 millimol of vanadium 3 and uh, when they treated the vanadium 5 with the glutathione they could follow this by epr 
And you can see that a typical EPR pattern for vanadium-4, this indicates that the vanadium-5 can be easily reduced to vanadium-4 in, in the presence of glutathione. And what we are showing is that vanadium-5 nanomaterial can be used as antioxidant using glutathione. How is it possible? So we used vanadium-5 complexes. You can see the bulk V2O5 is toxic to the cells. It kills most of the cells. And vanadium complexes where vanadium is in plus five oxidation state, again, they're highly toxic. But what about the vanadium nanowires, V2O5 nanowires? You can see it's not toxic at all. So the main difference is the redox potential. The difference in the redox potential, you can fine tune the redox potential so that glutathione cannot reduce vanadium-5 to vanadium-4. You can see this EPR spectra. This is the vanadium nanowire with glutathione. Nothing happens. Even with the hydrogen peroxide and glutathione, nothing happens to the material. And But vanadium complex like this, you can see the moment we add glutathione, the vanadium-5 is reduced to vanadium-4. And this is responsible for the toxicity. So what we found is that if you can modulate the redox potential of the metal center and make it stable in the presence of glutathione, you can perform glutathione peroxidase type reactions. And that's what summarized in this slide. You can see it's a surface reaction where the vanadium oxo reacts with the hydrogen peroxide to produce a peroxo. And this peroxo reacts with a nucleophile like glutathione if you correlate this with the vanadium halo peroxidase enzyme I talked about, it's very similar. What we used is a glutathione instead of a halide. And this performs the reactions. And what we showed is that nanostructures act significantly different from that of small molecules and bulk materials. Because vanadium-5 complexes and bulk V2O5 undergo redox reaction with glutathione that leads to the generation of reactive oxygen species. And uh, this is what happens on the surface. So this was the first time a redox active nanomaterial, which has been shown as toxic material and which has been shown as an oxidant. And we showed that it is non-toxic to the human cells and it's antioxidant uh, in nature. And this depends on the morphology and size of the materials. So we prepared many other materials and showed that the activity depends on the morphology and size of the materials. We used different peroxides to prove this, and there is no correlation between the surface area and the activity because nanomaterial people talk about, you know, when you make nanomaterial, the surface area increases and the activity increase, increases, right? But in this case, we do not find any correlation between the surface area and the activity of these nanomaterials. And, uh, we also used a lot of uh, spectroscopy techniques, time-dependent in-situ FT Raman spectroscopy to follow the intermediates produced in this. This is the key step, vanadium oxo going to vanadium peroxo. That's the key step. And then the nucleophile opens this oxygen-oxygen bond. And uh, the formation of this vanadium peroxido intermediate is rate determining step. And that depends on the morphology and the redox potential of the metal ions. And it behaves like vanadium haloperoxidase, but in this case, the reaction takes place on the surface and utilizes glutathione as the cofactor. And then you can see this vanadium peroxo and polarization of this is important. And the nucleophile attack at one of the oxygen, then the reaction continues. And we showed the crystal facet dependent activity of V2O5 nanozymes, depending on what type of facet present on the nanomaterial surface, determines the activity. And we found that the nanomaterials having 100010 plane exhibited very high activity in the presence of glutathione. And uh, the least active one uh, is the one that have uh, 001 plane. And now next uh, few minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the role of superoxide because in, in my introductory slide, I talked about uh, four electron reduction of molecular oxygen. Right? If you add one electron to molecular oxygen, it generates superoxide. Very, very important biomolecule. But how it is produced in, in biological system, in human body specifically? It is produced by an enzyme called NADPH oxidase. 
So NADPH oxidase introduce one electron to molecular oxygen to generate superoxide. But you look at the assembly process. There are many proteins are involved in the one electron deduction. Okay, many phosphorylation, dephosphorylation steps. It use NADPH because it has to pump the electron across the membrane, right, to reduce molecular oxygen. And very, very, uh, very well organized system to introduce just one electron. And it's amazing for chemists, right? So just one electron reduction of molecular oxygen is mediated by such elaborated biological processes. But what happens when other enzymes can do similar type of functions? So one of the enzymes that we are focusing on is nitric oxide synthase. We all know about nitric oxide. Again, Nobel Prize was given for the discovery of nitric oxide as signaling a molecule, right? Endothelial function and so on. And this is an, another heme enzyme, which use molecular oxygen again for the reactions. The oxygen binds to the metal center. But in this case, the main function of this enzyme is to produce nitric oxide. It's a diatomic molecule. It's a radical in nature, very, very important in biological systems. Okay. So if you look at the, the catalytic reaction, so this is where, you know, for chemistry, it's interesting. We study hemoglobin, myoglobin, uh, you know, in, uh, in undergraduate uh, classes where oxygen binds to hemoglobin and then oxygen gets released. Okay. This is called reversible oxygen binding, right? Why reversible oxygen binding is important because oxygen should be released as oxygen, nothing else. But in this type of enzymatic reactions, the oxygen should be activated and should be converted to something else, right? For a chemical reaction. When oxygen binds to iron two plus, it produces an iron three superoxide. This is similar to what happens in hemoglobin, myoglobin, right? But here, what happens the next step is addition of one more electron to Fe3 superoxide, which, which gives a peroxo, iron three peroxo, right? This depends on the electron donor. And in this case, it is the tetrahydrobiopterin in endothelial cells, it's a tetrahydrobiopterin. If this electron donor is not present, the next step does not happen. It leads to the release of superoxide. And these are called shunt pathways. And these shunt pathways can cause diseases. Okay. Because in this case, the deficiency of tetrahydrobiopterin leading to the generation of superoxide. And now you compare the superoxide generation by nitric oxide synthase with that of NADPH oxidase, very, very well-regulated enzyme system, which generates superoxide by one electron reduction. But in this case, it's not well-regulated for superoxide generation. So therefore, it leads to endothelial dysfunction. And this is the initiation of endothelial dysfunction. So this is the normal endothelium. You can see when the nitric oxide level goes down, superoxide level goes up, onset of endothelial dysfunction, atherosclerosis and then myocardial infarction or stroke, right? Heart attack. And a fundamental chemical reaction that takes place is one electron reduction by an enzyme, which is not meant to produce superoxide in human body. Okay. That's where, you know, we have been studying nanomaterials, nanozymes, which can regulate the nitric oxide synthesis in endothelial cells. And these are primary endothelial cells that we use to study the NO level in, this, uh, in these cells. And we use uh, different uh, biomarkers, different uh, fluorescent probes to monitor the level of superoxide. And as you can see here, this is a manganese oxide, MN3O4 nanozyme controlling the superoxide level and also bringing the nitric oxide level in the endothelial cell to the normal level. So you can see this is the hydrogen H2O2 activated uh, NO production. And this is the uh, manganese MN3O4 nanozymes regulating the NO uh, level in the endothelial cells, bringing the NO level to the normal levels. So therefore, uh, these nanomaterials will have great applications uh, in endothelial dysfunction related diseases. And we also showed that 
you can deplete the superoxide dismutase in the cells using siRNA. We downregulated the enzymes and substituted the enzymes with nanomaterial. And we found that by depleting SOD1, there is an increase in the reactive oxygen species, particularly superoxide. By treating the cells uh, with the nanomaterials, this is cerium vanadate nanomaterial that we used, cerium vanadate nanozymes, which can bring back the superoxide level to the normal level. So therefore, one can even deplete or downregulate the enzyme and substitute the cells with the nanomaterial. And it acts exactly like the enzymes controlling the superoxide and the reactive oxygen species. And if you look at uh, the development of nanozymes field, it started uh, from 1993 as DNA cleavage by fullerene derivatives. After that, in 2004, the term nanozyme was coined. After that, there is a rapid development in the area, nanoceria as SOD mimetic, and then this is a nano V205 as halo peroxidase mimetic. And this is our study. Uh, we introduced the concept of antioxidant nanozymes using V205 nanowires. And then this is also our from our group, MN304 nanoflowers as multi-enzyme mimetic. It mimic uh, glutathione peroxidase, catalase, and SOD. And very recently, we showed that nanozymes can also regulate ATP levels in mammalian cells. And uh, this is uh, the recent results. I'll show you just one slide that CEV4 nanozyme uh, in SOD deficient cells actually regulate ATP synthesis. When the SOD1 is downregulated or depleted, ATP level is brought down. So ATP production is affected and you can see there is a significant decrease in the ATP level. And this, is, this production happens in mitochondria and there is a decrease in the ATP level, which can be brought back to the normal level by treating the cells with the nanozymes. And even without the enzymes, it can bring back the ATP level. So this is our very recent results uh, from our group. And this is my last uh, slide. What are we trying to achieve? Okay, we look at the chemistry biology interface, how our standard chemistry can be used to address some of the important biological problems. If you look at the hydrogen peroxide level in the cells, Extracellularly, it varies from 0.1 micromole to 1000 micromole, but intracellularly, it varies from 0.001 to 10 micromolar. The cellular responses depends on the amount of hydrogen peroxide present. For example, at this concentration, proliferation can happen, migration, angiogenesis happen. But when you move right side, increasing the concentration of hydrogen peroxide, Stress responses, adaptation like NRF2 gene, gene regulation happens, inflammation, fibrogenogenesis, uh, tumor growth, metastasis, and then growth as arrest and cell death. So this is where it's important to classify the oxidative stress. And so far we talked about oxidative stress, but some stress is important, right? Some stress is good for the cells. So now it's important to differentiate the stress. And that's what uh, Helmut sees. He calls this as oxidative eustress and oxidative distress. Okay, So oxidative eustress is, is a good stress. and But when it goes towards oxidative distress, it leads to diseases. So the distinction of oxidative eustress and the oxidative distress may occur at a fine borderline. So we are trying to find this bind, fine borderline by using artificial enzymes, small molecules and the nanomaterials, can we find the fine borderline between the oxidative use stress and oxidative distress and regulate the redox signaling and control the redox state in the cells and then regulate all the oxidative, you know, antioxidative pathways in the cells to regulate the redox signaling. So I stop here uh, by thanking uh, my group members. This work was started with uh, my graduate student, Amit Vernekar, and then Dr. Namrata Singh, Dr. Sauro Ghosh worked on this extensively, and uh, Dr. Geetika uh, worked on the endothelial dysfunctions related to oxidative stress. And I thank the funding agency, Science and Engineering Research Board, DST Nanomission, and uh, my collaborators. And I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you very much, sir. I think that was a 
very, very interesting talk. Um, we have some questions that have started being posted. Yes. I would request um, all uh, to post their queries on the YouTube or uh, you could WhatsApp me uh, for those who are in campus okay. uh, so that I could read out those questions to professor. So I'll just start with what is uh, available in the WhatsApp. Um, can nanozymes be used as models to understand the mechanism of action of biological enzymes? Yeah, mechanism, uh, some cases it may follow similar mechanism and some cases they do not. We are not looking at uh, the exactly similar mechanism for the activity. Some of them may follow like V2O5, right? V2O5 uh, nanozyme, which, which has ox oxo bond and then it goes to peroxo, which is just like the enzyme, vanadium peroxide, perox peroxidase. But in my opinion, small molecules, it's easy to de design small molecules uh, to study uh, the molecular mechanism of enzymes than nanomaterials and nanomaterials uh, more towards the application. So it function as an enzyme in the cells, function as an enzyme in whole body. And then if some of the diseases can be addressed using nanomaterials and uh, nanomaterials, using nanomaterial to study the molecular mechanism uh, may be useful in some cases, but may not be useful uh, in many cases. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, I hope that would have addressed the, the query there. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, it's an interesting question from a PhD student. Uh, is the nanos, uh, can the nanozymes act in conjunction with native enzymes? Yes. Can they act yes. together? Yes, there are examples where uh, actually the enzymes interact with the nanomaterials. And in one case, uh, we, we, we showed that, uh, you know, uh, cytochrome C interacts with the nanomaterial surface and transfer electrons and uh, using, uh, you know, cytochrome C as electron donor. And in some cases, people have shown that, uh, you know, the enzyme nanomaterial interactions may enhance the activity. So it is possible that the natural enzymes can also interact with the nanomaterials in a different way. Some of the nanomaterials have been shown as inhibitors of certain enzymes. Okay, uh, there is a follow-up question on this. Uh, what is the efficiency uh, of nanozymes when compared to the native enzymes? Yeah, it's, uh, they are highly efficient it's very difficult to compare the kinetic parameters because uh, these are all, uh, you know, they don't, they are not soluble in water, right? They we use a dispersion, they're all nanoparticles. So very difficult to measure the concentrations, but the nanomaterials that we used are used in nanogram quantities. Okay, very, very small. So maybe you can say just a few particles are getting into the cells. So they are highly efficient in mediating a reaction. So you need very, very small uh, concentrations in nanogram concentration for, for these reactions. And Thank some you. cases, the nanomaterial have been shown to be even more effective than some of the enzymes. Uh, I think the stability factor would be a great uh, decider, yeah. determinant there, because the enzymes are so very um, fragile when it comes to conditions yes. in which they can be active. Yes. Um, I think your talk is triggering so many questions. I'm getting so many more on my WhatsApp. Uh, so this is a question uh, by a colleague of mine who says, uh, sir, we understand natural uh, superoxide dismutase contains uh, Cu2+, which is a redox metal as an active species, while uh, Zn2+, which is a non-redox metal, um, remains as a structural part. In that context, on what basis have you chosen cerium and vanadium, both uh, redox materials uh, for the mimic? Yeah, in uh, superoxide dismutase, there are, there are different type of superoxide dismutases. And uh, what you have mentioned is a copper zinc superoxide dismutase, which is the cytosolic one, which we call it as SOD1. And the zinc plays a co-catalytic role. If you look at the molecular mechanism of superoxide dismutase, uh, there is a bridging histidine, right? The histidine first coordinate to copper and then to zinc. So that coordination is important. So zinc is essential for the copper zinc superoxide dismutase activity. But if you look at the other superoxide dismutases like a manganese superoxide dismutases, which is SOD2 present in mitochondria, which has a redox active metal, only one metal, manganese. There is no other metal present in that. 
and you also see nickel superoxide dismutases also nickel 2 plus nickel 3 plus iron superoxide dismutases iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus these are all mono mono metal mono nuclear metal containing superoxide dismutases so what is required is that one metal should undergo oxidation reduction reactions in the first step it should mediate an oxidation reaction and the second step it should mediate a redox reaction so therefore redox active metal is important for for this and cerium cerium undergo oxidation reduction cerium 3 plus and cerium 4 plus manganese also is redox active metal that's the reason these nanomaterial are, are able to mediate superoxide dismutase reaction thank you sir uh, there is another query uh, usually the enzymatic activities of each enzyme depends on the protein chain attached to them uh, i believe they are referring to the uh, sequence of amino acids that are there yes but here uh, v2o5 nanowire uh, as such can mimic enzymatic activities as you have shown in your data yes uh, compared to the molecular complexes what is the unique feature or the driving force for this v2o5 nanowires uh, to mimic the enzyme function because yeah. they lack yeah. all these one, one one is the uh, you know stable oxidation state the vanadium nanowire surface act as a just a platform in contrast to vanadium complexes because in vanadium complexes what happens the vanadium 5 is reduced by as and reducing agents like glutathione but that doesn't happen in the vanadium nanowire surface and uh, in enzymes the active site is present where many amino acids play important role catalytic role or co-catalytic role but in the case of nanomaterials we do not have such uh, groups but still one can generate such reactive sites which are known as a defects and these defects on nanomaterial surface can act as a catalytic sites and we can generate active sites by creating defect defects in one case we have shown in cerium uh, vanadate or uh, cerium oxide nanomaterials by creating such defects you are modulating the ratio of cerium 3 plus and cerium 4 plus and therefore such defects can be used to perform catalytic reactions so these are active sites the defects are used as active sites wonderful sir uh, so there is another query which i think again is uh, in uh, based on whether nanozymes can be uh, useful as mimics um, can we study reactive nitrogen species using nanozymes yes uh, uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to regulate the uh, nitrogen no level and react when we say reactive nitrogen species one of them is uh, peroxy nitrate which is a reactive nitrogen species and uh, people have developed a fluorescent probe to detect such reactive nitrogen species. Okay, so attaching a fluorophore to a nanomaterial surface. Okay, and then using it as, as a sensor for uh, finding out the reactive nitrogen species concentration uh, in the cells. So it is possible. I'm sure it would be. Uh, there are a few questions from um, uh, undergrad students also. Yeah. Uh, Hello, sir. It was really a wonderful lecture and very informative. Basically, I am from a biotech background. So my questions uh, will be centered on uh, nanoenzymes as an alternate of enzymes. Um, first query uh, is whether these nanozymes could be used commercially also. Do they have any commercial potential? So nanozymes are now entering into nanomedicine and uh, there are nanozymes like cerium oxide which is in phase 3 clinical trial for uh, for diseases and uh, so far uh, no successful nanozyme in the market but they are in clinical trial so maybe we have to wait for a few more years to see and because nanozymes nanomaterials they are not soluble right they are all particles small particles and mm -hmm. where do they go in the body and uh, what are the organs they target and how they localize in those organs and how they are eliminated from the body. So these are all important questions when it comes to the development of a medicine based on uh, nanozymes. But certainly a few nanomaterials are in phase three clinical trial. So that means they, they passed all the toxicologicals, you know, other type of 
uh, toxicity studies, pharmacokinetics, and so on, they are in clinical trials. So we may have to wait for some more time to see whether they can really find applications in nanomedicine. Okay. Um, there is one another query, I think, uh, which is uh, highly relevant. Um, one of the important advantages of enzymes are their specificity. Uh, can we make nanozymes uh, very specific? Uh, I think this question arises because you mentioned about manganese oxide nanoparticles, which mimic uh, three different antioxidant enzymes. Yes. So, specificity is important. And uh, for example, the V2O5, highly specific to hydrogen peroxide. It doesn't react with the tertiary butyl peroxide or other organic peroxides like cumin peroxides. Doesn't show SOD activity, doesn't show catalase activity. It's highly specific to glutathione and hydrogen peroxide. So that gave us a clue that you can design a nanomaterial with highly specific, uh, which function highly specific on a particular substrate. But MN304 shows three different activities. And again, that is important because superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, is the level of this is interlinked, right? Because hydrogen peroxide is produced from superoxide. So therefore, in that case, mimicking the three enzymes which are relevant to each other, then it becomes important. If it shows three enzyme activity, which are completely uh, different, they function as different enzymes, they are not uh, related to each other, then that cannot be used for such applications. But in this case, it mimics very relevant enzymes, glutathione peroxidase, catalase, and SOD, because this is the heart of the antioxidant system, right? NRF2 associated gene and the expression of these enzymes. So therefore, even showing three enzyme activities is important here. There is no need for a highly selective nanomaterial, but in applications where high selectivity is important, one need to develop nanomaterials with the high specificity. I think there are a couple of other questions, so I'll quickly shoot them. I yeah. think these are more of a general nature. Uh, so this uh, question uh, is more on a potential application. Can we uh, employ uh, the redox reactions of these enzymes for applications in stimulate responsive drug delivery or regenerative medicine and so on? Yes, uh, people are using it. They started using it in regenerative medicine already. As I mentioned that, you know, many of these areas are just, they, they just started developing and uh, it may take some more time to see whether really they find applications. Yes, I think uh, we all look forward to that. And uh, I think uh, we are running out of time. So I would just uh, push in this question, which is a hypothetical question uh, by again, a biotech student. Could there be any non-carbon-based life form where all the enzymes are replaced by nanozymes? I mean, can we make an artificial cell that contains these type of nanozymes exclusively? Uh, see, in, in the cells, the coordination between different biological uh, function, different enzymes, small molecules, you know, they all behave in a very, uh, very well-regulated and network systems. And bringing all, substituting all of them with uh, nanomaterials is, is a huge task. And uh, because the gene regulation is a very complicated process, you know, hundreds of uh, genes and the corresponding enzymes, small molecules, regulations. And uh, one particular pathway may be regulated by, by nanomaterials but substituting all of them with nanomaterials require, uh, you know, multiple groups working on this in, co in, in collaboration and trying to interlink these biological pathways and how they are uh, regulated. Okay, so it may be possible to produce a part of that, but I'm not sure about, you know, mimicking the entire uh, organ or entire cells by using nanosystems. Yeah, absolutely, sir. I think cell is too complex, but I think uh, your talk has triggered a lot of uh, interest in uh, these kind of artificial systems. Uh, I personally had a question which I thought I couldn't uh, resist asking uh, or mentioning. So you had also looked at different type of uh, nanostructures, uh, you know, uh, other than wires to see whether there is an influence on their, um, yes. uh, on their enzymatic activity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you said you couldn't find any differences in their activity per se with morphology or the size. 
Um, but I believe that um, their internalization or localization into the cell, the cell uptake could probably be influenced by the shape and size. Uh, yes. That yeah, yeah. I mentioned that there is no correlation between the surface area and the activity, but we do see a difference in the activity uh, depending on the morphology or the size. So the uh, morphology does affect the activity. There is a huge difference in the activity when we change the morphologies. Uh, and of course, the cellular uptake will also depend on the size and morphologies. So that we are currently studying the type of, you know, the pathways of cellular uptake and how does that depends on uh, the size and morphology of the nanomaterials. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Mukesh. I think uh, your talk had been uh, not only very informative, it has also triggered uh, a lot of out of the box thinking among the students. I could see such a deluge of very interesting questions. Uh, what I also uh, uh, tell the students as a take home message is uh, the kind of passion that uh, Professor Mogesh, uh, it, he has to actually look into uh, domains uh, which are not too chemistry. They are there at an interface between chemistry and biology and uh, the kind of insights that he and his group have been able to bring on board. Uh, it is really actually giving us new directions. I want you to remember that, that passion is important and asking the right questions uh, would probably lead to new uh, thought processes, new uh, innovations. Uh, I'm sure you have learned a lot from uh, this lecture. I would join all my uh, Sastra colleagues to congratulate Professor Mukesh for this achievement of winning uh, the Sastra CNR Award for this year. And we look forward to more interactions with you. I would like to inform the audience that Professor Mukesh was in Shastra last year for the Inspire Camp. Okay. Uh, we do hope that we will get the opportunity of meeting and interacting with him and continue. I hope that he will continue to inspire all of us into looking into uh, common things, but with new eyes. Congrats once again, sir, and thank you very much. Thank you all for your very enthusiastic participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. We'll sign off now. Thank you. Thank you.